Dear viewers, dear friends, dear colleagues, uh, my name is Daniel Lukiewski, and uh, on behalf of the Kyiv Security Forum, I have the honor to welcome here the distinguished and prominent guests. We have an unprecedented format today. Four U.S. ambassadors and Prime Minister Arseniy Yatsenyuk, with my modest and humble contribution, will discuss the matters of peace and security in Ukraine and our common efforts to deter Russia's aggression. Let me warmly welcome and present here three ambassadors, three former ambassadors to Ukraine, among them John Herbst, uh, Stephen Pfeiffer, William Taylor, and Ambassador Kurt Walker, former U.S. Uh, special Representative for Ukrainian negotiations in 2017 and 19. Uh, on Ukraine's side, we have Prime Minister of Ukraine, uh, Arseniy Yatsenyuk, the Chief of Ukraine's Cabinet in 2014 and 16. Uh, uh, I'm really happy, I'm, I'm excited to, to see you, uh, dear friends, and I'm happy that you are with, with us for, uh, for, for the online discussion of the KU Security Forum. Uh, I would like to, first of all, to thank you, dear ambassadors, for being such strong friend and true friends of Ukraine, such strong promoters of U.S.-Ukraine strategic partnership. I also wish to acknowledge an important contribution of Prime Minister Yatsenyuk into Ukraine-U.S. relationship. Uh, let me also use the opportunity to thank our friends and partners from the Atlantic Council who also contributed to our today's event, and they will help us communicate this story as wide as possible for as many viewers globally as possible. Uh, the Ukrainian and international audience looks forward to your sincere and friend, frank exchange, frank discussion. The realities, risks, and perspectives of the ongoing peace efforts. This is the focus of our today's debate. How to push the peace process forward? How to make the Russian aggressor accountable? How to ensure the long-lasting peace in the Eastern Europe, in the for stability and security for Europe's Eastern Front? And I'm going to, to rush immediately into these questions. And I will start by asking Ambassador Herbst, dear John, I, uh, uh, let, let me address you first. In your article uh, for the National uh, Public Radio um, of April 6, the famous article, and I thank you very much for, for doing this together with Ambassador Pfeiffer and Ambassador Taylor, uh, you sent a very clear message. You directly, what I understand, addressed President Trump and suggested, I quote, the United States and its allies should offer to lift international sanctions against Russia if Putin will end his military incursions into Ukraine. And then you explain, you, you say that you believe that the pandemic uh, crisis uh, creates uh, an unexpected opportunity for, for that. Let me ask you frankly, what makes you think that this idea might be successful and this move might be, might be successful? Uh, don't you think that the whole endeavor, a noble endeavor, may send an ambiguous signal. Do you really believe that there is a real ch chance for breakthrough now? And uh, what is most importantly for Ukraine? And who will you think will pay the, the price for everything Russia did in Ukraine if your idea comes true suddenly and Putin decides to withdraw on conditions of candid goodwill? Excellency. Okay. First, I think the credit for this article goes um, to Bill Taylor, who drove it. And I was happy to join and make some suggestions on the article. And in fact, the target for the article was in the first instance, not so much Moscow, but Washington. It was a way to remind President Trump, as he and President Putin were talking on a somewhat regular basis regarding the pandemic, that in fact, Putin has great vulnerabilities here. And if we're going to talk about peace in Ukraine, it should require Russia giving up its imperial adventure in Donbass in the first instance. So that was the motivation for the peace. Having said that, this may be a time 
where at least some in Moscow understand that it's time to seize their aggression in eastern Ukraine. There are at least two reasons for this. First, the pandemic is a major policy problem for the Kremlin. It's a major problem because we've seen the number of reported cases in Russia, especially in Moscow, just mushroom. And it's not clear that the Kremlin has the ability to handle it. You have the very unusual situation where Mr. Putin is handing off responsibility to regional governors because he doesn't know what to do. So that's point one. Point two, the whole pandemic problem has led to a sharp drop in global demand for oil. And the Russian economy depends on hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are responsible for 40% of Kremlin exports, Kremlin export earnings. And suddenly they're not earning anything. It's worth remembering that the Soviet Union imploded at the end of nearly a decade of low oil, and price, oil prices. It's worth remembering that Moscow's aggression in Georgia and its aggression in Ukraine in 2014 came when oil cost over $100 a barrel and the Kremlin felt flush with resources. Um, I was quite surprised that the presidential spokesman in Moscow, Piskov, deigned to criticize our article. That meant there are people in Moscow who understand that we, what we were saying makes perfect sense. And it's also important that Peskov not only ridiculed our article, in order to do it, he had to mischaracterize it. He spoke as if our article was all about Crimea, whereas Crimea was part of our argument, our principal argument was about Donbass. Now, why would Peskov do that as the spokesman for Mr. Putin? Very simple, because Russians like Crimea as part of Russia. The Russian people have no interest in Donbass. And Moscow's aggression in Donbass is a political liability for Putin, which is why ultimately he will have to get out on terms consistent with Ukraine's sovereignty. So this may be the beginning of a real conversation in Moscow about this. Excellency, thank you very much for, for such an answer. And now I turn to Ambassador Taylor. Uh, William, uh, for, first of all, thank you for, for drafting that, that interesting article. And uh, here I have, I noticed an, an, an important turn in, the, in, that, in that piece. Uh, you write, uh, while years of diplomacy to end the Ukraine war, you, you say this term, you use this term, the Ukraine war, have stalled. Uh, a high level push now from the United States could break that deadlock. By saying so, you somehow recognize that the progress uh, achieved uh, uh, in the peace process since 2014 is very limited, if any. And uh, obviously the reason is very simple, uh, the, aggressor, the, the aggressor does not uh, uh, stop committing its crime. The Normandy format unfortunately fails to do much about the aggressor to stop that aggression. They did a lot, but nevertheless, the war is there. The Minsk agreements were signed under pressure. The nature of the Minsk agreements is extremely controversial. Can you, can you give us our, your, your, your frank assessment? What do you think? Where does the Minsk process really lead us? Constant deadlock frozen conflict, real peace. Can the Normandy format do something about Russia? And don't you think that the very nature uh, of the Minsk compromises may once undermine the overall Ukraine's independence and sovereignty? Please, William. Benino, thank you. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to join you, my colleagues, Prime Minister, um, this, is, uh, this is quite a crew you've, uh, you've assembled, Danilo, so congratulations. Thank you. On your question, I think it's an important one. Um, and I think the overall important issue to keep in mind is the outcome. The outcome is to get the Russians out of Donbass and uh, eventually out of Crimea. Keep the, get the Russians out of Donbass, turn the Ukrainian territory back to Ukraine, uh, so Ukraine has uh, control over its sovereign territory and the border, inclu including the control of the border. So that's the overall goal, as you say. And as we said, uh, Minsk has not achieved that. Uh, Minsk is, a, is an old agreement. It's uh, been around for 
a long time, uh, uh, and and it can be built on. It can we can go beyond Minsk. We can try things. Now, I say we. It's the international community. But in the first instance, it's going to be Ukraine. Um, and Ukraine has has done that. And I think that the experiments, the variations, the the tests um, are a good idea. So beyond Minsk, um, you know, as Kurt Volker knows, uh, uh, an international Peacekeeping force is not in Minsk, but it's not inconsistent with Minsk. Um, it, there's a, that idea has been around. We ought to uh, explore that. The Ukrainians ought to explore that. Um, uh, you mentioned the Normandy format. Uh, Normandy format um, has had some benefits, of course, uh, but if it doesn't work, then there are other formats, or you could expand. It could be Normandy Plus, and there's some indication. We indicated that the Americans uh, might well uh, make a contribution. As uh, John Herbst just said, uh, uh, President Trump and President Putin have a, a line of communication. That's that's we, that could be useful in the in the uh, Normandy Plus format. Um, there have been other experiments um, that Ukraine has tried. Ukraine has had some success um, it, in some of these and some some failures in some of the others. That is the prisoner exchanges. Good idea. Move forward. Establish some some trust and some, some confidence. Um, on the other hand, uh, there was this flirtation with the Steinmeier formula, and that turned out to be a bad idea. Uh, but none of, the point is, there are, it's urgent to solve this problem. It's urgent to get the Russians out of Donbass on Ukrainian terms. And so moving forward on several of these ideas, uh, these, of these experiments, I think is important. And, and you should have, and I hope will have, the continued support of the international community and even greater support from the United States. Uh, thank you, thank you, William. Uh, and uh, and now let me turn uh, to Ambassador Walker, if I may. Uh, since there is not only your article which became famous uh, recently, but there was a, a fabulous piece written by Ambassador Walker, and I also thank for uh, his strong stance and strong message sent to the Ukrainian authorities, to Ukrainian Rada, and to the Ukrainian president, indicating the most important benchmarks to be achieved. Mm -hmm. In your article, Kurt, you, in your article of April 8, you write, I quote, Russia sees a weak Ukraine without international support as an easy target for the continued application of military, political, and psychological pressure, which is true, which is felt every day here in Kyiv. In, in Ukraine overall. Kurt, mm -hmm. you've been in charge of peace negotiations for two years, 2017 and 19. Um, Surkov is out. Instead of him, Dmitry Kozak entered the scene. Uh, before the crisis, I mean, the, the crisis we experience now, it was clear that Russia fosters a wide regional approach related to Ukraine, Belarus, and Moldova. They have this kind of white Kremlin's thinking mm -hmm. represented by Dmitry Kozak. Mr. Kozak did his best to engage Mr. Yermak, President Zelensky, top foreign policy aide and now chief of staff, into his plans and intentions. How do you read the current Russian tactics, Kurt? Yeah. Uh, do you anticipate any serious shift in the Kremlin strategy towards uh, Ukraine in the nearest perspective? Anything that you may publicly warn the Ukrainian authorities uh, not to get trapped into? And uh, what do you think? How should the United States be represented now in the peace process? Your floor, please. All right. Th thank you very much, Danilo. And uh, it's, it's great to be here with you and, and with Arseni and with John and Bill and Steve. It is a tremendous group. And thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I have a couple of thoughts on this, and I'll try to, to be quick about them. First, uh, your question was, is there reason to be optimistic about uh, Putin's uh, position, a change in Russian policy and so forth? And I would say no. Uh, I don't think there is. Um, I thought that John Herbst in the beginning of this conversation made some excellent arguments about pressures that may be existing in Russia, uh, which I think uh, are worth thinking about. But nonetheless, I would also point out that on the opposite side of the equation, uh, he sees weakness uh, in Ukraine. He sees the US uh, off the table 
He sees a France uh, that is courting Russia, a Germany that is distracted by its own domestic political uh, uh, changes, and of course, coronavirus affecting everybody. And so I think Putin is quite comfortable. Uh, you mentioned the change in personnel uh, from Sorkov to Kozak. Uh, when I had the opportunity to, to meet with uh, Mr. Sorkov, I never had the impression that he was the decision maker. I always understood that Putin was the decision maker. And likewise, I see that with Mr. Kozak as well. The decision maker is the same. Uh, the person representing is somewhat different. And as you correctly pointed out, Danilo, uh, Mr. Kozak has been close to President Putin, and he's been the architect of this structure around Russia of breakaway republics that have some form of permanence or semi-permanence that Russia can use to destabilize neighbors and to prevent uh, they're becoming a closer, uh, more integrated part of the West. So I think that strategy remains in place and I haven't seen anything to indicate otherwise. With that being my perspective, uh, my advice to Ukraine, and, and thank you for mentioning the article, uh, my advice to Ukraine is, is exactly the opposite of what that sentence said. Putin sees a weak Ukraine as a target of opportunity. Therefore, it is vital that Ukraine become as strong a Ukraine as possible. And that strength is going to rest in uh, financial stability, uh, cleaning up the rule of law so that foreign investors feel confident, establishing a strong record of economic growth, pursuing consistent economic reforms with a, with a good rule of law system, only attracting foreign investment that will spur uh, economic growth. If those things can all happen, Ukraine will become increasingly strong. And that's where I see is the real opportunity to change uh, Putin's calculations. As long as he perceives that there's little cost and he can continue to disrupt Ukraine and Ukraine's aspirations to be a more integral part of Europe, then he'll keep going. When he sees that those efforts are not producing any results, and in fact, Ukraine is getting stronger despite that, um, then those costs become more apparent and it is an opportunity to then start that kind of reflection in Russia that John was talking about. Maybe it's not worth it. Uh, that's what I think Ukraine needs to strive for. And then coming finally to U.S. policy, uh, which is I think what all of us are, are thinking about, uh, it would be uh, extremely helpful to see the U.S. re-engage in more active support for Ukraine, more active engagement with France and Germany in the Normandy process, and more candor about Russia's aggression in Ukraine and the need to continue to push back on that. Thank you, I do appreciate I do appreciate everything you said. Mr. Prime Minister, uh, let me ask you, what's your assessment of, uh, of everything we see right now in the arena, in the theater of the, of the very difficult peace process? How do you estimate, how do you, how do you feel it what 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 would what the scenario would you prefer and what you envisage what would be the way how to promote the the, the peace process your floor please oh pleasure to see you you know as the world is obsessed right now with the way how to tackle coronavirus how to overcome economic troubles and uh, economic dire situation that we're going to face in in the nearest future it's so important that today we have this kind of debate over the future of Ukraine, over the way, how to pave the way to peace, how to take back Ukrainian territories that were illegally annexed by the Russian Federation, Crimea, and invaded by the Russian Federation, which is Donetsk and Lugansk. So first, it's important to have Ukrainian case on the radars, despite the fact that all national governments are focused on their domestic issues. This should pass too, and this shall pass. Okay. Uh, I, I, mean, I mean the troubles that we are facing right now. So the second thing is that uh, Minsk is far from being perfect, too far. And I was never a strong proponent of the Minsk deal. And the reading we had of the Minsk deal was as false. Look, we have nothing else on the table. And that's it, period. Okay? Uh, the Minsk already served uh, for the sake of the Ukrainian people. The idea was at least to have a 
full-fledged ceasefire, it's still not on the table. And I want to reiterate this. Yes, there is no, uh, we, due to the means process, we stopped uh, full-fledged Russian military aggression into Ukraine. But Russia even refuses to implement and to execute one of the key pillars of the means process, which is to stop the killing of Ukrainian people and Ukrainian soldiers. So there is no trust needed to put not to the Russian government. But Russia has to realize that right now we live in completely different world. The oil prices are nose diving. So the same is going to happen with the approval rating of President Putin and with his entire red tape Soviet style bureaucratic machine. They will be out of cash. So they will try to do their best in order to lift sanctions. Uh, there is a regular tactics uh, that is implied by the Russian Federation to put the blame on Ukraine to no avail. We did everything we can in order to show to the entire world that Ukraine is acting in a good faith. It is Russia who is constantly violating the Minsk deal. I want to be very clear. This is not the deal. And this is not an international uh, deal. This is not an international treaty. It's a kind of memo. Okay? So Russia is constantly violating this memo. And I believe that uh, at the current stage, we have... Um, perfect arguments in order to overhaul or upgrade the means process. And distinguished ambassadors already indicated this option and this possibility. Uh, I am a strong proponent of an idea to have a broader, I would say, Normandia format. Our American friends could be the part of this process, even despite the fact that uh, Americans are still have a number of problems inside. But look, you were always supporting Ukrainian independence. We commend the efforts of all US presidents and all US administrations. You backed Ukrainian people and you were fighting together with us to maintain this independence for the Ukraine. So uh, the next step, I believe that we need to have Americans on board. Um, so um, let, 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 let me put it this way. Mm, Minsk is not perfect. Uh, Russia will not execute Minsk unless or until we make the real pressure. Real pressure with the concerted actions of the Ukraine, European Union and the United States. This is the success formula for making peace in Ukraine. Uh, I do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, dear Steve, I have a, two difficult questions for you, if I may. For that reason, you know, I, I, I prefer to, to put them at the end of this first round. Ukraine certainly lacks the security guarantees. This is, the, this is the, the dramatic fact of Ukraine's independence. The Budapest Memorandum failed. The perspective of Ukraine's NATO membership was promised but never delivered due to different reasons. How can anyone be serious about long-lasting peace in this part of Europe if the, if the security of such big nation as Ukraine such a huge country, is primarily dependent on Putin's goodwill. What will you recommend? How Ukraine should change this fatality, should change this destiny? How can we consolidate the international efforts to make Ukraine protected, protect, protected strategically against uh, uh, Russia's offensive? And how to reset the peace process and to make it more comprehensive? how to not abandon Crimea, since Crimea is not literally in the basket of talks with Russia, even. Excellency, please. Okay, uh, let me try to answer uh, several of those questions there. I mean, I, I think um, in terms of Ukraine's westward course, I think Ukraine should maintain that. Uh, the relationship with NATO certainly is much broader and much deeper than it was back in the 1990s. 
Uh, my guess is that at this point in time, it's hard to see a near-term prospect for even, say, a membership action plan. But that doesn't mean that uh, the NATO or the U or Ukraine should give up on that. And I think that should still remain a long-term objective if that remains, in fact, Kiev's desire. Uh, and, and that's where I think the United States can play a role is keeping that idea on the table. And I think the U.S. government has done a pretty good job of that. Um, in terms of the resetting the peace process, um, I, I think I would agree with uh, the Prime Minister that you know, Minsk has not succeeded. Uh, but until there is something to replace Minsk, Ukraine probably needs to keep it. Because Minsk, importantly, is the basis for the European Union's sanctions on Russia. Uh, and you don't want to do away with that. And I also believe that the Minsk process keeps Chancellor Merkel uh, and uh, her French counterpart involved. And I think Merkel actually has done a very good job in keeping a fairly divided European Union together uh, in terms of maintaining sanctions. You know, it, had you asked me back in 2014, what would be the prospect of the European Union maintaining sanctions on Russia for six years and in fact strengthening those sanctions, uh, I would not have been that optimistic. And I, so I, I think the European Union has done a good job on that. And Minsk is the foundation. So the, the channel of peace building needs to sort of take Minsk as the basis and build on that, not just replace Minsk. Uh, finally, your third question on Crimea. I, I do believe that the Ukrainian government over the last six years correctly is focused on Donbass because that is where Ukrainians are dying every week. Um, and to some extent, I think you can separate the problems because I can see a path where Ukraine regains sovereignty over Donbass that is much easier than Ukraine's path to regaining sovereignty over Crimea. Russia clearly wants Crimea. Russia's not moved to annex any part of Donbass. And so the question comes back with Donbass is, how do you adjust that calculation in the Kremlin of the benefits and the costs. I believe the Kremlin uses Donbass as a mechanism to destabilize Kyiv, distract Kyiv, to di divert attention from the real reform problems that Ukraine needs to be focusing on. But I don't believe that the Russians actually want to take Donbass on. So the question is, how do you change that calculation? And that's where we need to find a mechanism to impose more costs. And here, I guess I'd be a little bit more optimistic than Kurt is, is I do think that, you know, it's not a comfortable position now for Vladimir Putin. You know, go back to January. He had big plans for the spring. You know, he was going to have, you know, the constitution changed. There's going to be this huge referendum that approved it so he could open up the possibility of remaining president until 2036. There was going to have this huge parade on May 9, which he would use for his own purposes to bolster his position. That's all gone now. And he's facing an economy that the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, says is going to contract by almost 6% this year. And the oil price, I mean, I just checked this morning, the price of a barrel of oil now is $21 uh, in Europe. And at some point yesterday, actually, the price of oil was negative. Um, the, the Russians reached this agreement with Saudi Arabia to reduce production by 10 million barrels of oil a day. Well, that's a step in the right direction, but demand's fallen by 25 million barrels. And in early May, there's going to be no place to store oil. So Mr. Putin may find that his economic situation becomes a bit more difficult. And hopefully that increasing cost to the Russian economy may begin to change the thinking in Moscow. As for Crimea, I think that's a much longer term issue. Uh, it, it's hard to see how Ukraine musters the leverage to get Crimea back. But that's an analytic judgment. I, uh, politically, it's still entirely right, and it's, it should be the policy of the United States and the West to continue the non-recognition of Crimea's illegal annexation by Russia and to continue to maintain those sanctions that were related to Russia's uh, takeover of Crimea. Uh, thank you. I do, I do appreciate and uh, appreciate your assessment and your, your uh, recommendation, if I may say so. And now uh, let us turn to the second part of our discussion, which is, uh, which would give us a possibility to have a, a bigger picture, to look at something which is going around not only Ukraine. Uh, 
and uh, uh, definitely we found ourselves in completely new reality uh, unexpectedly that's 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 the fact we face uh, everywhere right now how the new international realities may influence the relationship between the west and russia this question is one of the most important for ukraine's uh, of uh, security for Ukraine's strategic planning for Ukraine's foreign policy, uh, and for that, let me start by uh, let me start start um, uh, by asking uh, Ambassador Taylor, uh, William, please share with us your opinion how the new realities may influence the the relations between the West and Russia, which may become apparently weaker, but not less dangerous please and you know you're exactly right um and <clears throat> the context of this whole conversation has has pointed to these new realities i mean uh john herp steve pfeiffer the uh kurt volker and the prime minister have all recognized these major changes um that have been triggered by but uh, have uh, but were there for were triggered by the the, the uh, covid Health crisis, but were there that were there previously? I mean, the the, the weaknesses, the uh, the the weakness of Russia vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the kind of international community um, has been evident for for some time. Um, and as as we've said, and I won't go into any any great detail, but the but COVID leading to low demand for oil, leading to oil price crash, leading to economic problems for Russia, leading to economic recession across the world. All of those things mean that, uh, that, the, that these are new realities that he has to, that he has to address. Um, the, the, you mentioned the bigger picture. The United Nations Secretary General has, uh, has taken the opportunity to recognize this, the, this new reality of the COVID crisis. Um, and called for major changes, or at least ceasefires in, in some of these things. Mr. Putin knows how to get a ceasefire. He knows how to end the sanctions. He knows how to make himself better off in these new times, in these new circumstances, and it is to withdraw from Donbass. So those are the kinds of things that I think he needs to recognize and will, um, and I agree that there is a chance now. I, I agree with uh, Steve Pfeiffer, who says that there is some chance that Mr. Putin will recognize the, the, the changed realities um, and take the steps that he knows can have some effect on him. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, John, uh, now it's your turn to, 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 to answer the, the, the question. Uh, you know, a lot of experts here in Ukraine uh, got used to be uh, speculating on on the matter that a grand bargain, a grand bargain may arrive some someday. So, what what would be your take? What will what, what do you sense? Is a grand bargain between the West and Russia, grand grand deal, grand uh, um, agreement, which may include the Ukrainian interest, possible? Okay, look. Um there is a sad history of grand bargains affecting the nations of Eastern Europe. And the first name for that is Yalta. And of course, Mr. Putin has dreams of Yalta. He goes to bed every night thinking Yalta, Yalta, Yalta. Uh, but I think he's going to be disappointed. Um, I understand why he wants it. I understand why people in Ukraine are concerned by it. And I believe that there are people in Europe who would like to see it especially um, there are people in France who'd like to see it. I don't know if Macron is one of them, although people are concerned he may be. Uh, I think there may be people in the SPD in Germany who dream of Yalta too. I am confident that Chancellor Merkel does not. And maybe even President Trump thinks of something Malta-like, Yalta-like. But I can tell you that um, in Congress, Yalta is a dirty word, as it should be. Not just for Democrats, for Republicans. And we've seen that whatever, whatever conception President Trump may have about relationships with Moscow, um, the policy that he has pursued has ultimately been one that has been no weaker than Obama's. In fact, I, would, I used to say it was stronger into all the unpleasantness with President Trump's peculiar Ukraine policy late last year. But even with that, his policy overall has not been weaker. And I can tell you that if there was any 
true hint, real indication that President Trump wanted to head towards a grand deal which would sell out Ukraine and American interests in Ukraine. If we have strong interests in Ukraine, the Republicans in Congress would join with the Democrats and stop him. So I don't see this as a real possibility, although I understand why people think about it. Thank you. And, uh, you know, uh, and now I, I am going to ask Ambassador Pfeiffer uh, uh, about another extremely important instrument that we all uh, f try to use and uh, certainly we rely upon the effectiveness of that instrument. I mean, I mean the sanctions. Uh, what would be your take? Uh, do you really think that the sanctions work against Russia? Do they possess an important or do they have an in impact upon the, the Russian uh, tactics, if not strategy? And uh, uh, how would you, uh, what would be your um, prediction, how that sanction policy might be changed under new normal, under new realities that uh, surround us? Please. Well, I, I do think that the sanctions have had an impact. I think they're a very useful tool. Uh, economists say that uh, the impact of the sanctions on Russia have cost Russia maybe between one and one and a half percent of Russian gross domestic product. That's a significant number if you look at the Russian economy, which over the last four years has grown at about one percent a year. Uh, and that sanction impact, I think, will be felt more deeply in Russia. Uh, if, in fact, the economy in Russia plunges to recession, as most experts anticipate it's going to do. Uh, so I, I think the sanctions remain a tool, and they remain a factor in Russia's calculation. Now, to be clear, they have not succeeded in their objective, which is to get Russia to leave Donbass. Uh, but I would argue that in the past five or six years, there have probably been several points where the sanctions and the fear of greater sanctions probably impacted Russian calculations. So for example, in 2015, there was great fear that Russian and Russian proxy forces might take Mariupol. And that didn't happen. And part of it was because I think the Ukrainian military greatly strengthened Mariupol. But I think there was also a calculation in Moscow that that might trigger even further sanctions. So I, I do think that they remain a factor in Kremlin thinking. Uh, I find it a bit amusing that uh, you know, people like uh, Kremlin spokesperson Peskov say, well, sanctions, they don't impact us, we don't care. But it seems that every chance they can, the Russians call for lifting sanctions. So a couple of weeks ago, you had the video uh, teleconference of G20 leaders. What was Vladimir Putin's one big idea? Let's end all their national sanctions. That's how to deal with the COVID-19 crisis. At the United Nations a couple of weeks ago, the Russians put forward a resolution and it called for lifting sanctions. So I do think as much as they say sanctions don't bother, it does have an impact. And the challenge for us is to maintain those sanctions. And then perhaps if Russia does not begin to agree to a real settlement in Donbass, you know, I would like to see the West intensify those sanctions, though practically that may be a difficult question with the European Union. Uh, the idea to lift the sanctions from what we started our discussion today was in the focus of the, of the, of the article you have signed. Uh, Steve, uh, have you received any kind, I mean, excellencies, have you received any kind of feedback on your idea to lift sanctions if, if Putin decides to withdraw from uh, Ukraine? Uh, I would say I would, I would prefer not only from Ukraine, but from Georgia, from Moldova, and from other countries uh, around Russia that suffer Russia's occupation. Steve, have you, have you seen something from the White House that might be of interest and could be shared among us? Um, I haven't, but I'm in California, 2,500 miles away, so I'll defer to uh, <laughs> Bill and uh, John and Kurt on that question. Uh, but by the same token, I also think that the White House and Congress are very solid on sanctions. Uh, and I think the White House, and this is where I have a little bit less confidence in President Trump, but Congress has passed legislation which basically says that there's any move to lift sanctions, Congress has the right to block it. Uh, and, and I think that is a way to make sure that, you know, President Trump is not going to do something on his own. 
So I'm pretty confident that U.S. sanctions remain in place until Russia does what the sanctions call for. And one set of sanctions calls for Russia to leave Donbass, and then there's a second set that are linked to Crimea. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And now uh, let me ask Ambassador Walker. Uh, Kirk, uh, what we have right now, we have, um, I would say, a difficult political uh, situation here in Ukraine. Uh, we have Ukraine, a new already old Ukrainian leadership, uh, almost a, a year uh, of, of uh, the tenure of uh, President Zelensky, who uh, showed that he is very cautious, I mean, careful uh, about his steps in relationship with Russia. Uh, we we see how how difficult was the the last year in the United States. We certainly see how the, how the pandemic and the economic energy crisis may influence Europe, may divide, may may broke the unity within, within the Europe and so on. So this is the mess. This is something which might severely influence everything in 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 the future. In 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 this environment. How do you see the leadership of the United States with special focus on Eastern Europe? Uh, well, <laughs> that's a broad question. Uh, there's a lot of elements to it. Let me, let me take a couple pieces there. Uh, first, uh, I want to start where, where something we didn't mention before. President Zelensky and Andrei Yermak and, and the team there, I think, uh, have done a, a few very smart things and a few very important things in terms of uh, indicating quite clearly, uh, quite unabashedly, their desire for peace. Um, they're, they're speaking out and saying, we want to see peace in Eastern Ukraine. Uh, we will take the extra step, we'll go the extra mile. Uh, I think that's important tactically. It's important because it denies Russia the opportunity to blame Ukraine for failing implementments when we can all see that it's really Russia that is failing to implement the Minsk agreements. And so I think that tactically that's very wise. Um, what I think we all know, however, is that it's really in Russia's hands, whether they choose to bring peace to Eastern Ukraine or not. And that's where I think that the, uh, the year that has gone by since President Zelensky's election and um, the elections to the parliament uh, have not produced the, the kind of dramatic reform and rapid change in Ukraine that everyone had hoped for. And you know, even this coming week, we are expecting a vote on the banking legislation to prevent Privatbank from going back to the former owners, including Mr. Kolomoisky. This is something that was talked about over a year ago. I remember at the Toronto uh, Economic Reform Conference, there was a discussion specifically about this with the acting managing director of the IMF, David Lipton, where uh, there was a commitment to pass legislation like this and uh, close to a year has gone by and we're still talking about it. So I think this is a missed opportunity and, and something that really does need to get done. And I think people uh, in the government and in, in Ukraine and the parliament, Rada, all need to see this not as an end point, but as a beginning, maybe a new beginning that we, Ukraine has to get this done Ukraine has to secure the financing to stabilize the country's finances for the rest of the year, getting that from the IMF and the World Bank. But then more is needed on uh, the judiciary, on protecting the central bank, uh, on market reforms, on uh, regulating the role of oligarchs in the economy. There's, there's an awful lot there. So that, that set of issues. Turning to the US policy, I would uh, very much agree with what Steve Pfeiffer said about sanctions. Uh, I do not see um, any lifting of sanctions coming from the United States. Even if President Trump was so inclined, the Congress and the political atmosphere here are so against that it would be blocked. And so I don't even see that being pursued. The other side of the coin is I also don't see any new sanctions. Uh, I think we're at a stage now where coronavirus is dominating everyone's thinking. People are worried about the downturn in our economy and the global economy. And I think the idea of new sanctions on anything is, is strongly diminished. Third thing about US-Russia is that I do believe that President Trump wants there to be a win somehow in US-Russia relationship. Uh, maybe this year, and we're in an election year, or maybe to tee up after the election. 
But I think in terms of how he sees his legacy as an American president, he wants there to be a win in U.S.-Russian relations. My guess is that he wants that to be in the nuclear area. And he just recently appointed Marshall Billingsley, someone all of us know very well, uh, as the negotiator for uh, New START uh, to see about whether there is an opportunity for a nuclear agreement with Russia. I think Russia actually wants this as well. So this might be an area where in contrast to Ukraine, in contrast to Iraq and Syria, in contrast to our diplomatic establishments, there may actually be a mutual interest in some kind of nuclear arrangement and President Trump could potentially portray this as a win, whether it takes place before the election or uh, whether it takes place afterward. And the final point, uh, which is where your question was taking, was the U.S. engagement and relationship with Central and Eastern Europe. And I would have to say here, I think the top level engagement, that is to say from the president, uh, from the Defense Department and, and the State Department, uh, is maybe a little muted. Uh, it was muted under Obama, let's not forget that, but it's a little muted now as well. On the other hand, when you get below the top level and you're looking at the U.S. military, you're looking at our, our diplomats, you're looking at our engagement through NATO, uh, there has been an expansion and a, and a much uh, deeper involvement of the United States. We've deployed for forces further forward uh, in the uh, NATO area. Uh, we're increasing our presence in Poland. We've deepened and expanded uh, the number and style of exercises that we do in Georgia, in Ukraine. Uh, we are looking at increasing assistance and, and sales uh, in both Ukraine and elsewhere in the region. So I think that that engagement in the United States in the region has actually uh, increased under President Trump, even though some of the signaling from the White House is keeping the door open for some kind of win with Russia and a little bit more muted at the political level. Uh, thank you, Kurt. Thank you, thank you. And actually, I, I do appreciate your point um, uh, regarding the Eastern Europe. Uh, of, uh, our Polish partners did a lot to enhance their strategic relationship with, with the United States. And I believe that that was a very smart move and smart policies that they proceeded with. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, how do you see that picture? And uh, how Ukraine, you believe, should protect its interests right now when there is a mess around us, there is a mess within Ukraine, and how should we, how should we be strong in, uh, under this pressure of new reality? You know, Daniel, we're used to this kind of mess. Let me start with an idea whether it's possible that the West can reconcile with Russia. It wasn't the West who attacked Russia. It is Russia who attacked the West, the Western values, and it is, it is Russia who is attacking the, the, I would say, the normal standards of life and the best values of the Western society. Some people believe that they can cut the deal with Putin. Uh, I don't believe this. You can have the deal with Putin, but only on the terms and conditions set by President Putin. This is the only possibility which is on the table. You do remember all these different types of reset and reload policy, right folks? Another type of policy is that we can get along with Putin, they all failed. We can have the dialogue with Putin only in case if we are strong, if we stay and stand shoulder to shoulder, if we stick to our values, and if we fight for each other. And this is the next question you uh, asked. Whether Ukraine can cope with all these challenges we are facing? Solemnly, I am not sure. But in case if we form one united front, as we already have this front with our American partners and the, with the European Union. So we can make it if we do it together. Um, we already did it in 2013. Look, chances for Ukraine to survive were very low. 
And uh, I do remember a number of debates in different capitals and in different areas of the world. And uh, they were quite skeptical about the future of Ukraine. But despite this, we not just survived. We showed to the entire world that Ukraine is a European nation. And we can fight and we fight for our independence and for our future. So never give up. This is the only recipe I can uh, say to everyone, not only in Ukraine, but to the entire globe. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. I love to hear this. I love to hear this since I hear this for many years. And I believe that that's true. And this is, this is the principle which was uh, literally uh, uh, existentially important for, you, for Ukraine. Now we approach the third part of our, of our talk. Uh, here, uh, I would be happy if you use this opportunity to send a message to the Ukrainian authorities or to DC authorities with your, with your advice, with your uh, counsel, how to strengthen the, Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainian-US uh, strategic partnership. Uh, frankly, from my own experience, it's difficult to compare what we had and what we have right now. Uh, in terms of uh, 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 the level of political dialogue, I would, I would like to be mistaken, certainly, but nevertheless, what I see about the political dynamics, uh, the, uh, the exchange of, uh, of, uh, of senior consultation and so on. So, uh, please, excellencies, what, how, do you, how do you feel, what would be the best way uh, to uh, enhance our relations and to uh, improve them, if I may say so. Let me start by asking Ambassador uh, Herbst. The single most important thing that Ukraine can do to enhance bilateral relationships with the United States is to deal quickly and thoroughly the problem of corruption. This is the vulnerability Ukraine has, which apologists for the Kremlin in Washington like to point to in saying, what sort of interest can the United States have in Ukraine? Now, we have profound strategic interests in Ukraine, in part because the Kremlin is hostile to the United States and Ukraine is the main front right now. So we should be supporting you for that reason of no other. But again, your enemies in the West like to talk about corruption. Um, President Zelensky has done a good job in his nearly year in office in moving on reform. But as Kurt pointed out, the whole bank issue should have been resolved six months ago and it's still in doubt. I think it will be resolved properly, but it's still in doubt. And the whole question of the courts and the procurator general system, many questions remain. Uh, you had a, a clearly honest um, Procurator General, Mr. Reba Shapka, and he was replaced for no apparent reason. Have a situation where, where prosecutors in Ukraine are going after heroes of the Maidan. What in the world is going on? These are things which should stop. And again, in the West, in, the, in what United States in particular, um, people who understand American strategic interests in Central Europe and Eastern Europe need to speak up so that we, we have strong support in Washington. And I believe you do have that strong support, especially in Congress. And throughout the administration, if not necessarily at the very top. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, John. And thank you for mentioning uh, Tanya Turnovol. And uh, I believe that you know about Vladimir Vitovich's case and other cases that uh, are in the focus of our attention right now. And I believe that we will follow this. Uh, for, uh, let, me, let me ask this question. Uh, Ambassador Taylor, one minute, please. So this is an election year uh, here. Um, uh, it's important for Ukraine to stay out of our election. It's important for Ukraine to focus uh, on the kinds of things that John and, and Kurt and Steve have, have talked about. Um, those, those are the important things. Do not jeopardize the bipartisan support that Ukraine enjoys and has enjoyed. Um, this, is, this is a strategic asset that they have. Similarly, um, we've got a great uh, charge d'affaires in uh, Ukraine. Use the regular channel. Don't use any irregular channels. Use the regular channel through the charge. 
approve the, the next U.S. ambassador. The next U.S. ambassador uh, to Ukraine is, uh, um, is close. It just needs a couple of approvals, including the Senate. Um, but, but that's going to be important. Use the regular channel, stay out of our politics, and this will work. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. I, I believe this is, this is a good advice. Uh, 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 Stephen, what's your take? What would you recommend uh, uh, the Ukrainian authorities? L let me second uh, what Bill just said. I mean, Ukraine, unfortunately, was a big factor in the American impeachment drama last fall and in January. Uh, but I don't think Ukraine is going to be able to get out of our politics. Uh, first of all, Donald Trump does not want to believe that it was Russia that interfered in the American election in 2016. He has chosen instead to believe this fantasy that it was Ukraine. Uh, second, you have Rudy Giuliani out there. Uh, it looks like Fox News is backing away from him, but he's dealing, Mr. Giuliani is now dealing with this fringe American network, One American News. Uh, he's going to be trying to perpetuate this story that there was somehow this activity between the Bidens and Ukraine that was, was uh, uh, unsavory and perhaps illegal. Uh, and third, uh, I think there is a real risk, unfortunately, that uh, if uh, Vice President Biden begins to broaden his lead, most polls have him eight to nine points ahead of President Trump, but if that broadens, you may see some desperation in the Republican Party in the Senate, and they may try to launch some investigations into you know, what Hunter Biden was doing. And, and it's gonna be really incumbent on Ukraine to stay out of this. Ukraine needs to, you know, basically continue what it's done for the last seven months, which is avoid being drawn in on either side. That's the best thing for Ukraine to do in what could be a situation where Ukraine may be uncomfortable, but Ukraine's navigated that path well over the last seven, eight months. It keeps, it has to stay on the same path. Uh, thank you, Steve. Kurt, that's, that's, that's the time for, for, your, for your message. Okay, um, I'll be very succinct if I can. Um, first, uh, I think you can look at the Rada as, you know, the government, the, the servant of the people party has a uh, more than 50% majority, but it's fraying and can they hold it? But another way to look at it is the pro-reform, pro-European voices in the parliament are 75%. And so I would first uh, hope that there can be a reconciliation among the pro-reform, pro-European parties in the Rada so they can work together and do all of the things that Ukraine needs on banking legislation, on reform, and so forth. So uh, I think that that degree of pulling the 75% together is important. Two, uh, that needs to be put to work first in passing the banking legislation and getting that over with and securing the IMF deal. That's got to be the number one immediate priority for Ukraine. Third, I do believe it is important finally for Ukraine to regulate the role that oligarchs play in the political, economic, judicial management of the country. Um, they are important people, they're wealthy people. You can't fix Ukraine without them, but nor can you fix Ukraine with them controlling the system the way it's controlled now. Uh, in order to do that, I've advocated, and I will again advocate, uh, that there be firm antitrust legislation that restricts what any one individual or company uh, can control, and that this be uh, policed through a strong implementation mechanism in order to guarantee fair competition in the country. Once there's fair competition, there is a demand for the rule of law rather than an exploitation of the lack of rule of law. And a demand for the rule of law will create a playing field that will attract foreign investment and engagement with the international community as well. So I think that's vital for Ukraine. Once you get the uh, banking legislation and the IMF deal in place, that's got to be a major target going forward. And then I would agree with Bill Taylor, get a U.S. ambassador on the ground. And I would add to that as well, advice to the administration, uh, get someone to play the role of special envoy as well, because you need someone going around working the international side of things as well, the French, the Germans, NATO, the EU, Canadians, and so forth. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, I believe that this that was an outstanding session of extremely important advices for, 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 you, for the incumbent Ukrainian president and Ukrainian authorities. Mr. Prime Minister, now it's your chance to send a message for DC. 
uh, what would you say? What would you recommend to our American partners? And uh, uh, but seriously, if we speak about our strategic partnership, how should we strengthen the confidence? and uh, the, the, the mutual understanding of that vital relationship. The United States of America is a real friend of the Ukrainian people. We always relied on bipartisan support in the US Congress. We command the efforts of all US administrations to support the Ukrainian people. It was Russia who meddled into the US elections. And it is Russia who wants to undermine strong relations between the United States and Ukraine. This is the truth. We need the US ambassador to Ukraine, a type of ambassador right now we have at this panel. We need Kurt Volker or somebody like Ambassador Volker, a point person, someone very strong in the West Wing, who is to represent the US policy in Ukraine who is to be one of the strongest partners. And sometimes even, I won't say uh, Ambassador Walker mentors, but those who support, lecturers, let me put it this way. Uh, so we need to stay together and what we need, we need very strong Ukrainian leadership, strong political leadership from the president of Ukraine, from the Ukrainian government, and from the Ukrainian parliament. So, and that, that's, that's not something unimaginable or something impossible to pass the legislation which is needed to cut the deal with the IMF. It's as simple as it is. And this is in the interest of the Ukrainian people to implement further economic reforms, uh, to make this country is a country of the rule of law, to eradicate corruption, and to show the strongest political leadership for the Ukrainian people, to, for the moving of Ukraine towards the European Union, and strong Ukrainian leadership to show the closest ties between the Ukraine and the United States. We had it, we have it, and we will have it. I do thank you. Excellencies, we had a very important and very interesting discussion. Let me tell you that there, there is yet uh, another third article that attracted my attention before I prepared myself for our today's talk. That, that, that's the piece written by French philosopher uh, Bernard uh, Henri Lévy, who published that on April 17 in, in the Wall Street Journal. And uh, he had an interesting you know, piece about his experience right now in Donbass when, where he traveled. And what, he's, what he wrote in that article, I quote one sentence, for us, he says, heedless Westerners, this forgotten war in Ukraine should lie heavy on our collective conscience. It lies heavy on Ukrainian hearts as well. It lies, this heavy burden lies on us. And what I, what I believe, the most important thing, the most important conclusion what we have from the years of our struggle that shows that Ukraine strong, is strong and remains strong. And I'm 100% sure that Ukraine would prevail and Ukraine will remain strong with necessary strong support of the United States and with strong support of our true friends as you are excellencies. I do thank you for this talk and for this wonderful conversation. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.